this is the concluding uh, lesson on Baptist history, and we're going to get into the detail of uh, Baptist history of England and America, which really are, we spawned from England, obviously, uh, most of our churches actually were uh, uh, brought over originally from England when they colonized the Americas. And um, so we will go through that, and then we will do a slight comparison just to give you a difference between Anabaptism and versus Baptist, uh, and who, what groups really identify as Anabaptist versus uh, Baptist, because there's a somewhat of a controversy as to where believers' baptism actually uh, came from and, uh, and what it was about. We trace it back to obviously John the Baptist, um, but some people in uh, when they're writing the history, try to trace it back to just the Anabaptist movement, and it is actually a little bit different, and so there are different beliefs. So they just go through that a little bit. Um, <clears throat> starting off with uh, the English history, uh, and much of this is taken from the Trail of Blood, uh, written by uh, J.M. Carroll uh, in the hi historical records. He did a good job of really going through many of the documents, and as I said, uh, it's uh, with Southwest uh, Theological Seminary. Now that collection of documents so that you could actually go to the actual sources of what he was talking about. But um, in English history, the Romans had conquered England, um, actually I think slightly before uh, uh, the time of Christ's birth. And uh, when they had done so, once the church got established, you know, uh, after Christ's death and the apostles were going out, they took the advantage of going throughout the Roman Empire uh, of establishing churches. And as we see with Paul and his uh, epistles and, and so on, well, the apostles also took the gospel to England. And up until that point uh, of the fourth century AD, uh, the English church remained apostolic as did most churches before that. There were things going on, obviously, uh, in those churches, uh, but it remained there until basically the church started to become a church state under Catholicism uh, set up by Constantine. And uh, so when that happened, um, obviously they were under Roman rule at the time, so that's what happened. They became uh, Catholic churches instead of just the uh, apostolic uh, churches that have been set up. Um, <clears throat> it, it was the state religion up until 1534-1535. And that's when the event of Henry VIII splitting with the Roman Church occurred and the Church of England was created. Now I think most of you are aware of why that happened. Henry VIII wanted to get a divorce from his wife. The Catholic Church didn't allow it, so he says, I'm setting up my own church. Okay, it's about as simple as it could be as to why the reason was. That also followed some differences in beliefs. Um, one, re one thing that you'll find that is a very big factor, uh, a difference between the English Church and the Catholic Church is they allow their priests to marry. Obviously, and he wanted a divorce, so he wanted to be married. So he felt the priest should be married, not unmarried. Say that again. Who, 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 the, the Catholics didn't allow it. And yeah, I mean they don't allow it to this day, but they didn't allow uh, uh, marriages among the priests. And who did allow it? Uh, the uh, the English Church. The English Church. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Anglican Church. That's one main difference in, in their belief. Okay. It was all over uh, the issue of marriage. Um, <clears throat> then we have in 1553 the reign of Queen Mary. Remember, Henry VIII never had a son. So his daughters, that were by different wives, started to come, you know, make claims to the throne. Queen Mary reigned and began the reign of what they call, and she's called Bloody Mary because there was a lot of persecution because they, she brought England back to Catholicism. Well, after that, in 1558, 
uh, probably due to everything that was going on, uh, Queen Elizabeth was probably uh, installed by much of the noble nobility at the time, and um, she, you know, probably with the promise that she was going to church uh, turn England back to the Church of England, and uh, Queen Mary uh, paid with it by being beheaded. So uh, the strong, strong, real strong. Uh, you know, we're going <laughs> to the person that caused all this. We're going to get rid of them. And I mean, a very strong. She was in exile, and then finally Queen Elizabeth said, uh, "Enough, off with her head." Uh, probably enough that she, I think she was trying to uh, form a uh, another coalition to try to defeat Queen Elizabeth and take back the throne. And so she decided to just take her out. Okay, and this is her half sister, remember. <laughs> so this is this very strong feelings about what's going on. Uh, and this all had to do with even. This is what happens when state religions start to take place. You start to have power struggles among the secular people, the kings and queens, because they're actually ruling the church at the same time. Gives you an idea that some, somehow maybe their churches and their beliefs are not necessarily in line with scripture. Um, just a thought. Okay, a century later, the uh, and, and basically there's a lot of history here about how the nobility uh, of England and the royalty of England really just they were really taking advantage of the people Hi heavy taxation um, and uh, religious persecution a lot of things going on uh, and the Presbyterian Church had been making a lot of inroads into England and if you ever see there's a movie I think Richard Harris plays Oliver Cromwell Oliver Cromwell was asked to be the leader of this group and basically went to try to change the king's mind. When the king wouldn't, they actually battled. Oliver won. He was a very good tactician uh, uh, as far as military and everything else like that. He destroyed the king's forces and basically wiped them pretty much, you know, he kept them at bay. Uh, so for a century they were ruled by the Presbyterian Church. Uh, and Oliver Cromwell, and, and if you see, there's a statue I believe I can't remember where it's at in England, but there's a statue, Lord Protector. That's what Oliver Cromwell called himself, uh, Defender of the Faith. And, and so this all tied together. But you'll notice a lot of problems we have in Northern Ireland because he went over to Ireland and started to try to take out the Catholics there. So we have the. Presbyterians and Irish in Northern Ireland, not Irish, but Irish Catholics who battle just recently really sort of trying to get some peace over there. But for a long time, that's been, that's been a raging battle since the 1600s. Okay, so you, you get that idea that Ireland uh, was divided, the English still rule Northern Ireland. Um, so and that was all Oliver Cromwell. Okay, so you'll see that, that what's happening here with these church states uh, in England are uh, bloody affairs, quite, quite frankly. It's a lot of persecution in the Baptist church at this point in time is really being formulated uh, and they're still, they're being persecuted obviously by the Presbyterian church. <laughs> okay, so it was by, by the, by, um, the uh, king at first, and now it's it's with this, and we get to the fact that uh, in 1688 we start in England because I think the people were becoming actually the Baptists were making a pretty good movement in in the uh, in England, and you started to see there was more toleration starting to be given by the governing bodies. Um, so we had the first of three toleration acts which were passed and this allowed uh, religious freedom in uh, England except for the Catholics and Unitarians. And that, that, that's, that's interesting because the Catholics are, for, are, are being excluded because of their bloody history, just recent history when Mary took over. So that was, you know, well we'll give everybody else peace because nobody fought us but the Catholics, they were, one, they were trying to take over so we're going to exclude them. 
And as I said, with the Unitarians, we have a, a whole different set of beliefs, uh, really pretty much uh, probably, uh, we would consider it anti-Christian today with some of their, some of their doctrine. Um, then after the third act, 1813, uh, we see, now look how long this has taken, from 1688 to 1813. Uni the United States has been formed in, during this period of time. Okay, and it took till 1813 to have what we would call a total religious freedom uh, in as far as worship was concerned. In other words, you could gather together and not be worried about the king's men coming in and, and disrupting and taking you to jail. Um, but you'll notice that the centers of the Church of England wouldn't enjoy rights of marriages and baptisms being legally recognized until 1844. Okay, so that's a, that's a pretty good period of time that you're talking about uh, how, you know, more than, you know, close to 200 years of, uh, you know, not really, but you're, you're a second class citizen, basically, in, in England at this time, if you do believe anything different than the Church of England did. Um, and we have recorded during that period of time in 1609 that John Smith in Holland, okay, remember these acts uh, haven't even started yet in 1688, John Smith is actually the one who's credited with becoming the first what we call the General Baptist Church, it was founded in Holland. Now what else was happening in Holland at the time? Where did the pilgrims come from? They came from Holland also. 1620 is when they landed in Plymouth, uh, Massachusetts. Uh, so we had, Holland was sort of a, you know, more open and tolerant of different beliefs, and that's where everybody went to. Uh, so, but even among the groups in Holland, there was some infighting that was taking place because, you know, no one could agree and, so, you know, if you had a neighbor, oh, he's a Baptist, you know, shun him or whatever. It wasn't legally done, but it was by groups that were actually still, the, these, these religious beliefs were carrying on a lot of weight in how they were treating people. Um, and so we still had people looking for religious freedom to go to America. Okay, now John Smith, just to give you a little bit of background about him, he was an Anglican priest who came to believe in believer's baptism. So he came out of the Church of England, but came to believe by, through his study of the scriptures in believer's baptism. He also gave us, and to this day we still have it, a two-fold church leadership of pastor and deacon, instead of the three-fold leadership, which was found very commonly in the Reformation churches of pastor, elder, lay elders and deacons. So in other words, in, in churches that practice the threefold, you'll see an elder board, you'll see a deacon board, and trustees also. Okay, so you'll, you'll see all these different things that we, you know, we, we skip that one uh, thinking that, uh, and there are, I mean, even, I can tell you right now, probably, and we'll see this later, those that are still hold to a reformed belief uh, still may be even in Baptist churches taking the threefold okay and there is a much a great debate and it's very very difficult to really you know I mean scripture is really hard to come up with what what was really happening in the early church um, I mean you have to remember elders at that time were also called bishops which who were preachers and so we we take it to be that elder means Okay, the actual pastor, but you'll see that there were a lot of <laughs> bishops within the church itself. So, what did that really mean? Were they all preaching, or were they, you know? So it was like there's a, there's some there's some real differences on on that interpretation. His third position, which was controversial, was that all believers had to be baptized, uh, rebaptized if they were baptized as infants. So if you had a if you came to the Baptist church and said, okay, now I, I accept 
the Baptist church, but had been uh, baptized as an infant, that didn't count. So you had to be rebaptized. And, and in fact, that's still today in much of the Baptist churches. If you came from a, um, a church, like a Presbyterian church, but you, uh, you basically adopted the Baptist belief of believer's baptism, and you were only baptized as an infant, you actually are now saying, okay, to become a Baptist, you, you become rebaptized by immersion. Okay, so that's still a common thing that is done in today's Baptist churches. It's very controversial, caused a lot of problems within the uh, uh, communities at that point in time, even when it was, they were starting to tolerate you know, through these toleration acts, but I think that was probably one of the sticking points of, of, of you know, of you know, bringing the Baptists in as far as, uh, okay, we, we tolerate what you're doing. Um, okay, we go to, uh, from John Smith now, uh, and we saw previous, in previous lessons that um, when Charles Spurgeon enters the picture uh, in, um, in the 1800s, uh, he had a rekindling of what took place with the Baptist movement so that it became a very predominant uh, belief uh, among uh, Christian sects at that point in time uh, in the 1800s, so much so that uh, you know it's, he's considered to have uh, converted one million people okay, in his churches and, uh, so that he established. <laughs> So there was a strong movement in, in Great Britain in the 1800s uh, that spawned off of this later on and probably had a lot to do with uh, what was going on with Britain at the time of the Toleration Acts. The more and more people that became Baptists and everything else, they were more or less influencing what the government was doing. So this is why these Toleration Acts started to, to occur. And I think the, the Baptists had a lot to do with uh, what was occurring with uh, adopting religious freedom. Um, history in the Baptist churches in America then. Um, we had uh, what came and what caused America to really be colonized was really a search for religious freedom from English people. Uh, remember there was a uh, war over territory uh, for in America, uh, that was it ended up being the French and Indian War, and which the English basically won. But during that time period, as more and more English came over and settled the the land, this is when they started to butt heads with the French, who were up north in, in Canada and were coming down into the Americas. So there was there was a uh, fight over who owned what and everything else, and had happened to be that. Really, Pittsburgh was probably one of the main areas where the French were trying to claim it, the English were trying to claim it, coming in from the coast. So what you had there was a war, okay, and basically to the winner goes the spoils, and that's what's happened, okay. And uh, I know in, <laughs> in uh, Canada, when you go to Canada, you go to, uh, uh, what is it, uh, I guess it would be Ontario province. Uh, where Quebec and Montreal uh, are, you hear it called French, French Canadian, French Canada, and the reason that is occurred because if you go up there, on the trains, and we went in by train, on the trains you will see, they'll talk to you in English in Toronto. When you get into Ontario, it turns to French. That's the main language. Now you say. Wow, why did that occur? The English conquered them, right? Well, when the Americans started in their, their revolution to try to keep the French out of the war from siding with the Americas, they said, you have this province, this area is yours to govern under our auspices, but you can govern it and your language will be the predominant, your education will be the predominant and everything else like that. It's kind of kind of amazing how that is up there. Uh, so they get very upset if you want to talk in English. They will talk to you in English at the restaurants. I'm not learning French just to order something, you know. I'm a visitor here. 
But they, they get quite indignant. They, I mean, I, I can tell you right now, they do. They, they, they just, it's amazing how the French and the English are with each other up there. They hate the English, and the English hate the French. It's quite, quite a, you can say, you talk about hostility, there, there's true hostility. Uh, but they will take your money. Well, they, yeah, and that's why they talk to you in English, because they know that's part of, but, but they are really, uh, you know, he puts his nose up, you know, as the major D, you know, like, uh, like as if he's being asked to do something. So, you know, here's the green. Uh, you know, so it's, 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 a, it's a different thing up there um, when you get to Quebec. Montreal's not quite as bad, but Quebec is really, it's really uh, pretty <coughs> tough. They do not like the English all that much. Um, anyways, that's why uh, when we come over here, and uh, what colonized the uh, Americas was really the English, and uh, so who colonized it? It was the people who wanted religious freedom, the pilgrims, the Puritans, coming from the Church of England. They wanted to wash it the way they wanted to wash it. So this is why really the founding of America really took place. Um, I know there's a lot of people who try to downplay that, but it really was because of religious freedom. People came over. Um, okay, so we had uh, the pilgrims and uh, the Puritans who originally spawned by the Church of England and Presbyterians were among the first group to come to America seeking religious freedom. So what do those groups do? As soon as they get into power, <laughs> They keep trying to exclude everybody else. Uh, and during that period of time, 1620 to 1650, other groups followed, including the Baptists and Anabaptists, and after much persecution by the Puritans of Massachusetts, Roger Williams and John Clark were granted a charter by the King of Char by King Charles, who in fact hated Baptists, by the way. But apparently he found that maybe this would be a better way to uh, colonize, would be to separate them. So he said, uh, okay, we'll give you a, a charter, Rhode Island, which is a pretty small state. <laughs> okay, but uh, what they were able to do there was that the uh, Baptist preachers wanted to create a colony that had true religious freedom without fear of persecution, because they had just experienced that in Massachusetts. Uh, they wrote the fir a first state constitution that created true religious for, uh, liberty. The First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution was influenced by Rhode Island's constitution. Um, it's not the same, by the way. There, is, there are some differences in how they, how they approach the First Amendment of the Constitution versus how that uh, religious uh, liberty clause was put into uh, the state constitution. But. Um, it was it's it was influenced by it, so you can say that there was Baptist influence in religious liberty occurring in the United States. Um, <clears throat> in America, the Baptist churches that were formed were generally a loose configuration of many associations. Usually, these associations formed among uh, along theological lines such as Calvinism, Arminianism, and authority of scriptures, etc. Okay, so we had differences even among the Baptists now, in how they uh, would approach the, the scriptures and how they would, uh, what they viewed as proper. Okay, and so we're going to get into just a little bit here of the particular Baptist, uh, mostly in the southern states, by the way, um, and I know they still exist, are moderately Calvinistic, they believe in limited atonement and closed communion. Okay, what do those mean? Limited atonement and closed communion. As opposed to general Baptists who are moderately Arminian in unlimited atonement and open communion. Big difference. So what, what's, the, what's the defining difference there of why they believe what they believe? And it goes back to John Calvin. <clears throat> Limited atonement means that that the blood of Christ covered the sins of the world, but it's only effective for the elect. Mm -hmm. Okay, for the elect. Remember now, John Calvin also came up with the doctrine of predestination, that God chooses who's going to be saved. 
okay and this is demonstrated in families for example if grandpa and grandma become Christians then that starts to affect the whole family and how they're brought up and that they lead them to salvation and that's why you'll see catechism classes in those in those reformed faiths and once you complete your catechism class you're asked if you believe the doctrine and if you do you've already been baptized remember and if you do now you're accepted into the church so you're considered a Christian at that point and a church member only those that have been through that now have <clears throat> the rights of communion nobody else does you can't just say well that guy came from that other church and he believes in believers baptism and that, oh no no that's not close communion is only for those that actually follow the doctrine and uh, that are demonstrate that they're they are chosen by God big difference uh, and believe obviously in limited atonement uh, um, General Baptist, slightly Armenian now, what do Armenians believe? And this is where you get into some controversy because Baptists don't necessarily believe all that. But if you go to the other side of the spectrum, okay, you got predestination. Now you talk about free will, but you also have the free will to decide you can be a Christian at a certain point, but you can turn away from the faith. So you lose your salvation. That's Arminianism. True Arminianism. Okay, so you can lose your faith. Well, I don't think Baptists teach that. I think there's a, there's a, uh, Paul states that, you know, once you have become a Christian, you're sealed until the day of redemption. Okay, so how do you lose your faith? What they will say would be, you never had the faith to begin with. Okay, so there's, there, there's some technical differences here, but it causes a lot of problems in the churches today uh, when you get into this, these discussions. Uh, so anyways, uh, General Baptist basically allowing for unlimited atonement, which means anyone's welcome to a, a faith and not necessarily do you require catechism classes and everything else like that and we accept even other people who declare Jesus Christ as their savior that may not be Baptist okay uh, as long as they're a believer uh, they can even believe in a different way in baptism and everything else like that but if they're coming to the Baptist Church and they take communion we, we allow it because they're expressing because we believe it's all Christians are able to take communion um, and that's what open communion is all about uh, we don't sit there and judge okay what's your church membership and everything else like that are you able to take it or not uh, Catholics by the way are also close communion you have to be Catholic to take communion there you can't just be uh, a Protestant at all uh, so that's that's where that's at now American Baptist Association really became the gathering during that time probably uh, through the colonial period Baptist Association started to gather together and the and it was under the General Baptist by the way that this American Baptist Association formed and until 1845 was one big group in America at that point in time but there there were Two split, uh, there was a split into two groups based on the issue of slavery. The northern group retained the name of American Baptist, the, and we have it today. We have American Baptist. We were at one time an American Baptist church here. And uh, then the Southern Baptist Convention was the other that came about uh, through that. And uh, uh, probably much larger now than the American Baptists are. Uh, they are the largest Protestant denomination in America. So, but many differences even within that Southern Baptist Convention when you start to look at. Why did we leave the American Baptist? Well, uh, that was over, I, I think, the issue of homosexuality that it was <coughs> accepted 
uh, uh, homosexual marriages were being accepted in some churches. They're based on the East Coast, and uh, I had one pastor tell me that the further west you come with the American Baptists, the more conservative you'll find them to be. So those things that are happening, you know, women in the pulpit and whatever else, homosexuality, um, that's basically an East Coast decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I can remember when we were talking about this way back when, when that this association came, the, uh, the problem was that the American Baptist can, said, you know, the hierarchy said, well, you know, we have a loose configuration here and we allow a lot of autonomy among our local churches, and so we're still going to allow them, even though we don't believe what they believe. So then you had a a problem with that. So, anyways, uh, the last thing I want to go over, and I said we're running late again. I gave you a chart on Anabaptist and Baptist. You'll see some differences among uh, what Anabaptists believe versus Baptist, and you'll see there is quite a difference. Um, and uh, where you have Anabaptist faith is generally Quakers, Mennonites, Amish, these different little sects who were big in America at one time. Uh, they have a tendency to separate from society. Um, and then you have the Baptists who basically if you look at what we're, what we're looking at is what our church would be uh, you know, a part of. Uh, I think that it is um, something that you, won't, you don't see here, but there is also the part of what they believe Scripture to be. Scripture is not infallible in their terms in the Anabaptist, whereas in Bap Baptist belief it is. So that's, that's a big defining difference too. Not on the chart though, but I just wanted to give you a, a little bit. You can read it and see what the differences were. And so that you, a lot of what we have occurring when we have talked about Baptist history, we say, well, we don't believe that we ever spawned out of the Anabaptist movement because they, they went off in another direction from this group that we call Baptist. So, and it, it, like I said, we've seen a, a trace of remnants of people who were <laughs> persecuted heavily, but still maintain a certain faith, uh, even going up through to England and then England coming over. where. The English and the Americas were really where the heavy Baptist belief was. Okay, really, I mean, we do have some around through missionaries and everything else, but it's really through those two countries that where we have the heavy Baptist belief at this point in time. So that's it. We got through Baptist history.